really important to get the next week to do the session. Mm -hmm. um, so if you would please just give me the microphone for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm mindful of the time, and um, I uh, imagine we'll have some colleagues coming in uh, in a few minutes, but I wanted to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning. Um, welcome uh, to this faculty forum, Diverse Views and Inclusion in Today's Pedagogy. Uh, my name is Stephen Roper. I'm the Executive Director of the Peace, Justice, and Human Rights Initiative. And uh, I've been working with the colleagues that you see seated here to um, create this uh, panel um, as an opportunity to discuss diversity in the classroom and uh, talk about um, overcoming differences. Um, I want to first thank uh, my colleagues for participating uh, in, this, uh, in this panel. And Pat Darlington, who um, was scheduled to present, unfortunately made the mistake of uh, taking the flu shot yesterday and came down with a terrible bout uh, last night. I spoke to her this morning. She, she sounded terrible. So she sends her apologies that she will not be able to be with us. Um, but I, and I know that she very much wanted to. Um, I think that uh, this particular panel is extremely important given the today's environment that we see where um, Facts become fake news, identities are being challenged, uh, historical givens that uh, we thought uh, we uh, had accepted are no longer being taken for granted. Um, and really the classroom has become the forefront of these kind of cultural battles that we see in which civility and dialogue um, have uh, become lost in the discussion. Um, and I think as we saw in Charlottesville, uh, universities really are at the epicenter of this ongoing struggle that we're having in the United States about who we are and about what we stand for. Um, so that the issues that really can divide us as a country we see oftentimes uh, can play out in the classroom and also lead to divisions in the classroom. So the question is, I think, how do we as teachers and mentors engage students and ourselves in confronting our biases? And that was going to be Pat's presentation is how do we as educators even overcome our own biases um, and do so in a way that encourages dialogue and understanding. Because I think as colleagues, we know that navigating uh, conversations is an important part of pedagogy. Um, and today's forum, I think, gives us an opportunity to come together to discuss the challenges that we see, the opportunities, um, and share thoughts and strategies. So I appreciate you being here today because this is really uh, very much a conversation uh, with everyone. So, I think by definition, how we deal with diverse issues in the classroom is an incredibly broad and yet very important topic. So this form is just one step in a much larger journey. Um, there's so many ways, so many different issues that are involved. Um, but we wanted to begin and have uh, this discussion because we think it's a very important discussion. And as we've been organizing this form, I've been reflecting on the larger issues involved in the promotion of best practices in the classroom, which has led me at least to kind of three conclusions. First, the discussion today is not about faculty versus student. Even though we don't have students represented, it's far from it. I think all of us would agree that excellent pedagogy places student learning as the centerpiece 
uh, as the fundamental for teaching in the academy. So uh, today's uh, not about really talking about troubled students, but more how do we engage students to overcome difficulties that we may be having. And second, diverse views can come in any shape or form and in any discipline. So for those that think that these sorts of contentious views are limited to just the humanities or social sciences, um, I think if you look at discussions today on issues of climate change, the role of technology, healthcare, uh, you see that the issues that we're engaging with, uh, the diversity of views, represent the full canopy of the disciplines um, that would be at FAU. So how we manage, I think, diverse views in the classroom is something relevant for every discipline. This is not specific to any discipline. Um, and it's really about um, social interaction, which I believe really all um, disciplines have some sort of uh, discussion and moral obligation on social choices. Finally, I think today's forum is a demonstration of the need for robust and sustained faculty development um, and here at FAU to have uh, resources available where your colleagues can share experiences um, and identify opportunities for discussion and growth, not only for our faculty members, but I think for teaching assistants, um, as well as to allow for discussion with students. So we would have been talking about that. We hope that this is part of a a larger opportunity to really engage uh, faculty development so that this is not a one-off, but rather a starting point to a larger project on faculty development and teaching. So uh, we'll proceed in the order uh, that was listed on the flyer. Uh, each presenter will have approximately 10 minutes or so. Um, and, and I'll uh, ask colleagues to hold off on questions until the very end. I think we'll have a lot of robust discussion then. Uh, we are streaming uh, this live, and I'm mindful uh, that our colleagues are joining us remotely. Um, and what I would like to do is to yield the floor to them first when we do have Q&A, because oftentimes colleagues who join in remotely are sometimes forgotten about in these sorts of discussions. I very much want to make sure that they have an opportunity. If you're joining us remotely, please make sure to turn your microphone off. Uh, because it does pick up sound. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'll introduce our, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Eileen Allgood uh, from the College of Education. And um, Dr. Allgood's the senior instructor in the College of Education, the CCEI department, where she's been teaching pre and in-service teachers in critical multicultural education courses for, for over two decades. Her primary areas of specialization research include genocide and Holocaust studies, religion in public education, and culturally responsive curriculum to uh, mitigate prejudice. She's published several articles and book chapters on these topics and has presented her work at national professional conferences. Eileen's the uh, recipient of three prestigious awards that recognize outstanding teaching at FAU. And then prior to coming to FAU, she was the regional associate director in charge of education initiatives at the uh, Anti-Defamation League. The title of her presentation is Discussing Controversial Topics in the Classroom. So without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> well, uh, while it's being loaded, um, uh, let me just uh, begin by telling you that uh, when you teach multicultural education, Dealing with contentious issues is part of the curriculum. Uh, it's all about um, confronting, challenging, and contextualizing uh, contemporary issues that um, hinder, very often hinder, the chances of uh, students who come from diverse backgrounds. And my intention today is to share with you uh, some of the experiences I've, I've had uh, in teaching multicultural education and the controversial issues uh, that are uh, the mainstay of it. And not to give you uh, all the answers, because uh, quite frankly, I'm still figuring out some of the answers. But you know, through experience uh, in dealing with uh, these hot button issues, um, I've learned a lot. I'm going to share it with you as well as some research uh, from uh, full of scholars in the field and what they have to say about uh, handling controversial topics. Okay, so if we can advance to, thank you. Okay, so um, as I said, having these uh, conversations um, can be very, very challenging. Um, 
And um, one of the things that I usually start with is, uh, well, I use a Jeopardy approach. I'm a, a Jeopardy fan. And so I, I, I start out by saying I, I'm more about questions than answers. I don't have all the answers. And um, we're going to be seeking answers together and try to solve some very difficult problems. But before we, we can do that, um, we have to think about the right questions to ask. Um, and so that we can read and find out more about the problems that we're discussing and look at it and understand what causes these problems. Because you can't uh, solve a problem if you don't know what it is or what, it, what causes it. You might be trying to fix something that's not broken. So um, we spend a lot of time examining the underlying causes and it's contextualized in a historic context. We're talking about issues of racism or fakeism or classism. Those are the kinds of things that have historic context that we can look at, and we do that um, in, a, in a way that sets the stage. So you can see there's no shortage of uh, controversial topics that we can talk about, uh, and many of them are um, part of the curriculum, actually. Um, students in one of the multimodal classes are asked to choose a problem to investigate, a contemporary issue. And um, they look at it and they do some research, but they always start with looking at the underlying causes of the problem. Um, and then they look at the impact that the issue has on all the stakeholders. Um, and uh, the, the, the victims and the bystanders and, and, and so forth and so on. And it's very important to look at the power differential um, in these kinds of issues. So we, um, we spend a lot of time you know, thinking about the, the power structure and how it impacts uh, people who, who don't have power, don't have as much voice. And one of the ways that, um, that I uh, contextualize this for students uh, and actually kind of depersonalizing it in some way because um, to avoid some of the heavy emotion, you know, it, it shouldn't be about, you know, so much about this is my experience and this is why I'm angry and this is what you should do and it doesn't get into that level. Um, I depers I have them uh, process case studies which are depersonalized. It gives them uh, a problem in the context of how it might look in a classroom. and. Um, they investigate and we look and examine all the underlying causes that possibly could be causing um, these kinds of problems. Uh, and I have an example of a case study just to, to show you uh, a couple. Every uh, topic has a variety of case studies. This one I think is uh, on mm -hmm. religious diversity or faithism. So he. Would somebody, um, I'll, I'll just read it for you. So it's, um, this is Carlson, a fourth grade teacher, wears a small cross necklace visible to his students. One of the students, Eric, notices the cross, cross and asks her what it symbolizes. Mrs. Carlson responds, I, I wear it as a symbol that Jesus died for our sins. Eric tells his parents that his teacher taught him that Jesus died for his sins. Eric's parents complain to Mrs. Carlson. So um, there's probably very little that's more controversial than talking about religion in a, in a classroom, religion and politics, which is two of the things that we do. So in that case, um, students you know, would first look at, you know, why, or I would ask, why are the parents upset? You know, what is it that um, happened that caused the parents to be um, challenged the teacher? And, and they examine you know, her response to the question and things like that. And this is all in the context of understanding you know, First Amendment religious liberties clauses and um, after doing a, a fair amount of reading. And then it becomes a practical problem solving kind of activity. You know, what, you know, uh, what did the teacher do that, um, that crossed the line of the, the First Amendment, um, for example? Um, and you know, and so that kind of that's an example of how uh, it would be depersonalized, but still gives it a very um, uh, real practical feeling. Okay. Um, so this 
So uh, there's multiple sides to every story. Um, and we try to always present um, the various viewpoints of all the stakeholders in, in each situation. Um, uh, Geneva Gay said it best. I'm just going to read it for you because we can't improve our perfection. Racial, social, and cultural differences matter profoundly in U.S. society and schools. The effects of inequalities are profound and pervasive. Denial is not a viable strategy for coping with these horrific realities. Not teaching students about the causes, manifestations, and effects of these problems, as well as how to fight against them, is an indictment of schools for failing to provide an education that is equitable, relevant, and realistic. And in her uh, work, uh, uh, Children Need Education for Assistance, she outlined several ways that educators um, uh, can um, uh, behave in such a way or facilitate in such a way um, that allows for the controversy uh, to be a safe um, uh, discussion, uh, resisting extremism, uh, resisting singularity, resisting complacency, resisting quick fixes, uh, resisting tyranny of the new. Resisting quick fixes is an important one because um, there, there's so much emphasis on trying to get to, you know, that's the problem, that's how we fix it. Simplifying, oversimplifying, overgeneralizing. Um, and, and that comes from years of schooling where students are taught that there is, there's a solution to every problem. But when you're dealing with complex human uh, conditions and problems, they, there aren't quick fixes. It takes quite a bit of uh, uh, brainstorming, collective action to, to get to a place where you can start moving in the right direction, let alone solving it completely. And so, you know, we, we try to slow things down in that way and look at you know, many possibilities and always going back to underlying causes and things like that. But I think that's a, that, that's a very important blueprint to, to uh, look at. Um, I've also included um, uh, Paul Gorski's work. Uh, he did work on cognitive dissonance as a strategy in social justice teaching. Um, he, you know, he uh, is interesting because, you know, the, for those who are not familiar, cognitive dissonance is, um, he says, it's like um, putting on intellectual emotional body armor. So when a topic has an emotional affective uh, impact on someone, they get very, you know, very defensive. And it's, it's both a cognitive resistance as well as a, uh, an affective uh, resistance. And the idea is um, to facilitate an environment where students shed that armor so that they are willing to grapple with new ideas uh, without just accepting them blindly, but critically um, thinking about them. And so he, said, he suggests teaching directly and explicitly about cognitive dissonance and making students aware of when they are um, resisting. Uh, and to give you an example from his, from his work, um, let me just give you um, this example. Who said this? I'll read it to you. I am not now, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social or political equality of the white and black races. I am not now, nor ever have been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office nor of intermarriages with white people. There is a physical difference between the white and black races, which will forever forbid the two races living together on social political equality. There must be a position of superior and inferior. And I am in favor of assigning the superior position to the white man. Does anybody know who said that? Those were Abraham Lincoln's words. Cognitive dissonance, there it is. We don't expect that, but those were his words. So having students be aware of when they're feeling uncomfortable or when some new information causes them 
uh, to you know just feel you know, it doesn't fit with their paradigm and they want to reject it, have them become aware that they're uh, being uh, cognitively dissonant and, and articulate the discomfort and work through it so that ultimately they can shed that armor and they can uh, accept new ideas and think about new ideas without just blindly following them because the teacher said, said it, but to come to it themselves is the best way. And so uh, another uh, uh, researcher, I don't want to pronounce that because I will probably butcher it, uh, two researchers, um, they present uh, strategies for facilitating resistance in the classroom too. Uh, pretty simple, affirm students' rights to resist. Uh, resistance is okay. Um, it reminds me of the uh, old Star Trek movie where uh, the Borg, and if you were attracted to the Borg, their <laughs> mantra was, uh, Resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. I can't think of anything more frightening <laughs> than that. Um, so um, resistance is not futile, and we need to encourage um, conscious moral resistance, um, not passivity. And sometimes things should be resisted. Sometimes bad things that in the social environment occur that should be resisted. So we shouldn't squelch students' passion uh, to resist and speak up, but instead you know, channel it into ways that will make a difference in solving the problems. And they give some pretty good uh, explanations there. Um, okay, so uh, and here is a, I don't have all my notes here, but uh, this is another example of some resources that um, you can uh, draw upon to help. This is a whole book uh, on it. Yeah, if I can uh, steal my notes back there, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and this is from a, a source called Start Talking, a Handbook for Engaging in Difficult Dialogues in Higher Education. And if we can move to the next one, please. Uh, I have the, I have the bibliography for everyone. I have I have the um, handouts, so you have all these sources available for you. It was my goal to provide you with as many resources as I could in, in my ten minutes. Okay, so this is from the University of Michigan. Their guidelines for discussing difficult and controversial topics. Um, and it's interesting how they divide it in planned discussions and, and spontaneous discussions. Sometimes they just come into the classroom and you have to decide whether you're going to deal with it on the spot or you're going to defer it to another time. Um, and and the, their suggestions are really, really good. And moving on to uh, the next um, resource. Uh, this is from uh, Bettina Kip what instructors can do to safely facilitate controversial discussions. Um, planning discussion, establishing the right tone from the beginning, which uh, Dr. Swoman is going to be addressing uh, that as well, uh, describing on day one. Um, what I like about this uh, particular research um, is uh, examining your role as the facilitator and your own personal style and responses and being willing to acknowledge to students too that you sometimes feel uncomfortable um, with certain issues as well. And, um, and uh, debate and confrontation can be um, difficult, but uh, you know, acknowledging that you know, there are ways to communicate that de-escalate any of that emotional tension that can arise is part of the ground rules setting stage. And uh, always interrupt politely, that's something that I am always working on doing, um, it, you know, that, that uh, you, you channel and um, uh, redirect in, 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 a, in, a, in a polite way, acknowledging everybody's voice um, and skipping to solutions when things get really uh, heated and gets into the blame and, you know, the whole back and forth finger pointing thing that goes on, um, you know, just to, to start looking at solutions uh, when those kinds of things uh, circle. And always uh, try to offer follow-up. Don't let it be a one-time hit-and-miss kind of thing, but follow-up at a later 
date um, with, with those conversations in, in some format. Um, and uh, and uh, now I'm just going to um, share just a couple of words um, from a couple of my uh, favorite uh, researchers. Resistance is increasingly being understood as an opportunity for growth and learning. Actively resistant, uh, resistant behaviors require certain uh, kinds of interventions on the teachers, but there's also the passive resistant behaviors that we often have to deal with. Um, and sometimes they can be triggered by the content of the subject matter, but they could also reflect social and interpersonal dimensions of the classroom, such as the composition, uh, the issues, group dynamics, and other issues related to leadership. And uh, finally, if it, this is your, um, your resource page, uh, one more slide there, um, ending with uh, Gloria Ladson Billings. One more. Um, she says, students must develop a critical consciousness through which they challenge the status quo of the current social order. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Um, Eileen has uh, some of this uh, prepared handouts, and so we'll make sure that you get those before you do, because those are wonderful resources to have. Um, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Brian Nichols, and uh, Dr. Nichols teaches um, science methods courses for pre-service elementary uh, teachers and coordinates uh, FAU's environmental education master's program. Dr. Nichols has a PhD in science education and a master's degree in um, brain science and science journalism, and his research considers how education can improve our quality of life in an increasingly challenged, challenging world and create more just, uh, resilient communities and thriving natural ecosystems. And the uh, title of the Dr. Nichols presentation is Avoid Alienating Learners When Content Challenges Worldviews. And so I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Nichols. <coughs> okay. Uh, hello. I don't have visuals, but I do have handouts, so I'll make sure that they appear at the end or go up on the other website. But basically, um, I'm going to discuss diversity and, and inclusion from the perspective of worldviews, because we get students that come from many different places, many different cultures, and therefore bring many different worldviews to the classroom. And when you're teaching a lot of different topics, but in particular, it seems science, um, you can definitely get a clash of worldviews that bubbles up on certain specific topics. So. As you might have guessed from the news or your own experience of teaching, two of the primary ways this happens for many of us is when you are dealing with evolution by natural selection as a topic, or you are dealing with climate change as a topic. And both of those are important scientific topics that can cause trouble in the classroom, shall we say. Um, it's important to to sort of note that potential pedagogical problems, which is really good alliteration, can arise from these topics from different places. Um, resistance to evolution education is primarily religious, whereas climate change comes from a more political place, particularly from different views on the role of government in society. And so it, it's not necessarily all the same worldview or it can come from lots of different places. So I teach environmental ed, and I teach master's courses in that, and that's pretty much preaching to my choir. Those ones are easy. I'm not getting a lot of pushback when I say we need to do a better job of, you know, taking care of nature and that sort of thing. There's not a lot of resistance from those students, but when I'm teaching elementary science methods, those are pre-service elementary school teachers who are not environmentalists for the most part. They're not scientists for the most part. And, um, in fact, research generally shows that they're even more religious than the average American. And so it's a whole different kind of community when you're dealing with science. So <clears throat> just to get that, um, it's also important to remember, especially because I deal with teachers, is that resistance and or conflict can come from the students themselves but it can also come from 
members of their communities, members of their families, peers, other professionals, administrators they might have to work with. This is, there's like a web of possibilities that we're sending them out into as professionals that the topics that we discuss in class can cause problems for them. It's not just sort of this may be a problem, a controversial problem in class. If they end up with a job at a small school in Central Florida and start emphasizing evolution, they're probably going to hear about it from families, parents, administrators, that sort of thing. So you have to be aware of the greater cultural context that we're talking about these issues in. So having said that, I just have two kind of points about this stuff. First of all, there's the bad. <clears throat> when you're dealing with controversial topics, one of the first responses that we have as teachers and that they'll have when we send them out into the world is to just avoid them. It's the cognitive dissonance thing. Our brains don't necessarily like dealing with this stuff, so we tend to avoid it. And that <clears throat> is obviously something that we don't want. As instructors, as professors, we're also worried about our own job security or getting bad evaluations or getting into big class arguments and you know ending up on Fox News. That's the sort of thing that you know is obviously a concern and makes a lot of us avoid these topics that we don't, you know, that we shouldn't be avoiding. So <clears throat> critical content sometimes doesn't get taught because we're concerned about the issues that might arise from it. The flip of that is that many of us talk about this stuff maybe a little too aggressively. And so if we're preaching to the choir, that's great. But if there are students that have concerns, we alienate them. We, they tune us out right away. And so you don't want to tune out, whoops, you don't want to tune out 20% of your students from the very beginning because you approach the topic in the wrong way. It's because you framed it in the wrong way. You can teach the same content framed differently that might, you know, get actually 18% of those students as well, and maybe you only lose the two. So it's 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 a trade-off as an instructor, as a professor. I need to get this content across, but I want to do it without alienating as, as few, alienating as few students as possible. So that's that's the kind of bad part is. Um, the good thing about teaching, I mean, if it was all bad, we just avoid it, right? But the good things are the good things about teaching this stuff. Obviously, from my perspective as a science educator, you have to understand evolution by natural selection. It's a really critical thing to know, especially when we're dealing with diseases the way we are now and infectious diseases. Bacteria evolve like right under our microscopes. So this is something that we can't ignore or pretend isn't happening. And of course, you can make exactly the same argument for climate change. For, for kids that we're sending out now, it will be probably the biggest thing that they have to deal with. The challenges that arise, all of the global all global ch challenges that arise from climate change are going to be something that re they're really going to struggle with, much more than previous generations have had to. So making sure that they are equipped to deal with it should be a really important goal for all of us in education, especially since we're kind of the ones, <clears throat> we, we got the good part of the world and we're handing them off a, a more challenging one. So that's uh, something we should be uh, aware of as educators. So knowing that there's a bad and good to controversial issues, I will like also give some tips that I have picked up from my experience. And again, I've been teaching science methods courses for more years than I care to remember right now. And I've had students who are genuinely, genuinely concerned for my immortal soul by covering certain topics, right? They are like, you can tell, it's in their eyes. I'm really worried about you. So this is something that is an obvious, there, there's, levels of cognitive dissonance and conflict here that are really, really important to them. So it's something that you have to handle as an instructor if you want to reach as many as possible. So here are a, a quick dozen tips that I will use. And as I said, I'll also post these. But first of all, and this is problematic when we're teaching teachers, if you're going to get into this stuff, you need to know the content really well. You can't sort of float by, right? And we kind of float by a lot of the times when we're teaching your courses and that sort of stuff. Well, that's not going to fly because if you don't know the content really well, if you don't understand natural selection that well, kids, students are going to ask questions. It's, it's going to get messier. So you really need to learn the content more so than you would non-controversial topics. And that reason alone is the reason why a lot of us avoid it. It's, if it's new to us, then it's like, man, I don't want to get into that because I don't feel my understanding of it is enough to give me confidence to teach it. Um, a sort of PCK, a pedagogical technologist aspect of that is 
that you need to know what the common misconceptions are and what the common counter arguments are. And so, i.e., you need to Google it and see what the other folks are saying. And they'll have talking points on their websites, and your students will use those exact talking points when you are talking about this stuff. So, obviously, as not as a debater, but as an educator, you need to understand, okay, if my students are going to think this way, if they're going to have been told this before, I need to be able to address those misconceptions in the best way possible. You can't address them if you're not aware of them. So you need to do a little research and figure out what they have likely heard from the other side. Um, especially with the, the well, it, it, this works for both of them, but you, you need to understand why some of your students may be very strongly motivated to not agree with you. Like it's it's that their worldview conflicts with what you're saying in profound ways. And for them to accept that evolution is and has happened, for them to accept that climate change is a pretty important problem and government's really gonna have to step in, for them to accept that conflicts in a fundamental way with the way they see the world. And so it's a huge step even just considering it for them. And so empathizing and understanding that is really, really important to not alienate. Um, as I said before, that goes into their social milieu as well. It's not just their personal struggle in the back of the classroom. It's what happens when they take that struggle and say to their brother or their sister, hey, you know, I've been thinking about, or when they go back to their community and are talk talking to their pastor, here's what I heard at school, what's going to happen to them, right? These are, these are conflicts that don't just exist in a classroom and have repercussions for them once they leave. And being aware being sympathetic, empathetic to those kinds of struggles is important if you don't want to alienate your students. Um, from a science perspective, it's really important that you understand or you distinguish what you're talking about when you say controversial, because this gets used against you. Evolution is controversial. Well, yes and no, right? If you're talking to biologists, it's not controversial at all. However, it's culturally controversial. It's, it's theologically controversial. So making sure that your students, that you're clear and your students are clear about where the actual controversy lies is important because of course, they'll be told that, well, actually scientists haven't, haven't come to any kind of consensus about climate change yet. Or they'll be told that, well, you know, evolution, somebody came up with it 100 years ago, but it's mostly been discredited since then. So they'll be hearing different things you have to make them clear about what you're talking about when you use the word controversy. And it's generally not about the content or the science part of the content. It's about the impact of that content, socio-politically, culturally, that kind of thing. Um, you will need re really good classroom management skills. Yay. So here I'm telling you this, you know, you really have to know the content well. Well, you also have to know how to manage a classroom well. So you need to know if you're teaching undergrads, you need to know or expect what's likely to happen. You need to know that if this is an emotional topic for them, they can get heated, they can get defensive, and how are you going to manage that in the classroom? And I know some of us teach online, and there's different strategies, obviously, to mute them easier online, right? I'm just going to mute you, but you can't do that if it's a face-to-face -face class. You can sort of, so how, how you work out your, your skills or your own techniques for managing emotional debates is really important. And there's plenty of educators who know the content well. But every time they try to deal with this in class, it gets, it gets ugly for them. And they're like, OK, I'm just not going to do that anymore because that wasn't fun. And so you have to get good at managing emotional debates in your classroom, which means knowing your students well and all that kind of stuff. Um, tip number seven we're up to now, so we're going along here. Um, speaking of debating, you need to carefully consider what you're doing when you debate um, because, again, there's no point debating the facts most of the time, right? That's, we're pretty clear about most of this stuff scientifically, and so at least the, the, the underlying fundamentals, and people don't get their own facts, as we like to say. So yes, science is not dogmatic. Yes, you know, it's open to new evidence and that, but unless you have new and compelling evidence, if you're just rehashing the same talking points that have been debunked 20 years ago, then we're not really going to debate this. So it's, it's 
it's, it's kind of a delicate balance, but often a debate about whether evolution is happening is not the most productive use of your classroom time. You need to sort of move past that, especially if 85, 90% of your class already accepts it and just wants to get to, hey, how do I teach this? Or, hey, how do I deal with this? So you really have to think carefully about the debating part of what is worth debating. Um, it's something that you can address outside of class. I've had students who know all the talking points. They're, they're good. Like they have, I had one who had, you know, she had had dinner with the, one of the guys who makes those anti-evolution documentaries. So she knew what she was talking about from the other side. But for me and her to stand in front of a class of 30 other students and just go back and forth for an hour is not a productive, generally, use of the rest of the class's time. And so maybe you say, okay, come see me after class, we'll talk about this. Maybe that's better in smaller groups or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, however, <laughs> recent times have caused, we need to be a little bit more careful about things that are true and fake and fake news now, thanks to current events. And so whether or not you as a professor believe something doesn't make it true or false. You have to kind of go back to, and this is especially true for us in science, but science is based on evidence. And so you always have to go back to evidence-based consensus. And that's what, we're, when, we, when we're talking about evolution by natural selection, there's evidence-based consensus on that. When we're talking about climate change and our role in it, there's evidence-based consensus on that. The, the details get messier, and scientists are always going back and forth on some of the details, and that's fine. But you have to kind of help your students understand those distinctions, because they don't always. For, especially the way our news is, they always, you know, interview the guy who doesn't agree. And so you get this equal treatment when things aren't equal at all often. And so you do have to make those things clearer when it's controversial. You have to give students the context that they might not have to understand those kinds of distinctions. Um, I always like to make sure they understand words like dogma, relativism, um, consensus, I, you know, going over definitions for words like that is important because they might not really understand those words or, or sense how they might apply to the situation. Um, on that note as well, it's important to know when things aren't settled. We haven't figured out everything about how the world works yet. There's lots of areas of science and our understanding of it, especially when it interacts with social issues where, wow, we just, we're not clear yet. And that's fine. We're still trying to figure stuff out where, you know, that's part of the scientific process. So you can, you know, be clear about that. We don't, you don't have to know everything. And the society doesn't have, have figured everything out yet. We haven't. Um, it's important too, if you're getting into controversial issues and they're causing you some problems, that's a good time to take a look at what your course is and what its goals are and, and ask yourself, do I really need to address are these critical content? You know, is this critical content or is this just a pet passion of mine? Is it something that's really important to the goal of this course or is it just something I'm really passionate about so I want to, you know, talk about it in class? Um, obviously, when you're teaching biology, evolution is pretty important, so it's easy to make those justifications, but it's not as, might not necessarily be as easy for other topics or other courses. You know, if I was teaching economics, I would have a much harder time, you know, justifying why we were talking about natural selection in that class. So, hopefully. Um, hopefully. You, um, and then just to sort of wrap it up, the, the two things that I want to emphasize that you really need to consider as an instructor when you're dealing with these topics is that one is empathy, and I've kind of hinted at this throughout, right? You, you can't just aggressively say, no, that's wrong, this is right. That generally doesn't work. You really need to try to empathize with why your students might have conflicts. And again, they can have profound conflicts depending on their worldviews, like earth-shattering conflicts for them cognitively. So you really need to empathize with that. And then you you need to um, you need to create a culture of respect in your classroom. It's it's the idea that when you do debate or when they debate with each other, because that's often where it gets uglier, um, that they're they are addressing ideas and not people, that you are arguing with an idea, not a person. And, and, and just making sure that you create a culture of respect both between you and them and between them and each other. And if, even if it does 
get emotional as it often does if they respect you as an educator, if they don't feel like you're preaching to them or condescending to them, if they respect you, you are much less likely to end up on, you know, some video on Professor Watch or something like that, even if they disagree with you. So that's, on that horrible note, that's how all well, uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Um, all of uh, the... <laughs> The, the handouts or any sort of information that the presenters have, um, they, I'll make sure to get that information from them. We'll post, a, we'll create a web page that has a reference point so that the information can be uh, shared uh, with your colleagues. Because I think this is uh, fantastic. Um, it's it's interesting as, as faculty members sometimes all too often we don't really get an opportunity to talk about uh, what life is as a faculty member in the classroom, the challenges that we have, techniques that we have, and strategies. And so I think. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's so uplifting at some level to be able to share just the sort of basic discussion in terms of, you know, uh, the importance of teaching and, and different techniques. Uh, so our final uh, presenter today is Dr. Uh, Delise Gorman. Uh, Dr. Gorman has taught multicultural education uh, at the college level for the past 23 years, uh, beginning at Purdue University, where she earned her PhD um, in curriculum and instruction and her master's in organizational communication. Although her scholarly focus in multicultural education has been on effective teacher education, her courses are interdisciplinary and focused and work to highlight the uh, dialogue nature of teaching um, and learning. Her teaching philosophies are grounded in the principle of critical pedagogy and social justice. And she believes that education can be a catalyst for responsible, justice-oriented democratic living, but also acknowledges that education could just as easily undermine that outcome. Uh, and the title of her presentation is Clarifying Our Role as Educators in a Diverse Society and Setting the Tone on Day One. So I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Thank you again for this opportunity. Um, this is fun. Uh, and, and I approach this really as a dialogue, or at least at this point, from my perspective, more informally to sort of chat with you and reflect on my years of experience, uh, such as they are. Uh, and maybe share with you some insights that I hope might be useful. Granted, I teach in the area of multicultural education, which is a controversy a minute, uh, and, and others who might be teaching in geography or chemistry or whatnot might not have that same content. Uh, but I hope, I, I'm trying to think of this diverse audience uh, as, as, I, as I reflect on my own insights. Uh, and so I want to talk, uh, about my, my reflections in two ways. And the first way is, is really thinking about our role as educators ourselves, especially at the college level. Uh, as, as I reflect on my journey up to now, I remember being absolutely paranoid about the nightmare situation since I was in uh, at Purdue and in, in, in Indiana. Uh, a few miles up from a KKK stronghold, uh, I had this nightmare of what would happen if I had the child or the grandchild or the grand wizard of the KKK in my multicultural class. Uh, and, and, and how would I address that? Uh, fortunately, it was only a nightmare and it didn't come true. Uh, but, you know, I came to the conclusion that I would have to just teach the student like I would anybody else, right? My job would be to teach, not to argue, not to debunk, not to convince otherwise, but to teach. And that has been sort of a, a significant catalyst for me as I approach how I think about difficult students. These are students who I have had uh, been given the opportunity now to teach. And as I reflect back on my experiences, I have to confess those difficult students, such as they might be, are the ones who make us better teachers. Because you have to then look at these students, uh, and I look at them now, not as thorns in my flesh, but as problems, as, 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 as puzzles to be cracked. You know, how do I get behind the puzzle of the student? 
who is this student? And then beginning to recognize that the student that is sitting in front of you is a function of their experiences in the past. So asking, what was their education like? Who are they? Where have they learned? And recognizing that learning happens in so many different places, including the church, in the community, in the family. You are but one facet of that education. And now with media proliferation, you're even more insignificant. Right? So, so recognizing that this is something that, you know, the person in front of you as a learner has come to you with a set of experiences. What do you do now because it's your chance to have an impact on that experience? Right? And so look at it. I mean, I've begun to see this is my chance to either interrupt those experiences or turn it in some direction or, or to address it uh, you know, in, in, a, in a positive way. And I, I, I have begun to embrace that challenge. Now, granted, you don't always succeed. Granted, you don't always succeed, succeed in that semester or as much as you want, but that's your opportunity to begin to plant seeds. So I have also learned, thankfully, that I'm also not going to be completely res responsible for having to turn the student around 180 degrees, uh, but rather it is my responsibility to, to, to plant the appropriate seed. Uh, looking at students this way has also been helpful. I, I try to see students in terms of a developmental journey. And my own philosophy is that we are all on a journey somewhere, right? And at a very basic level, it could be that journey from close-mindedness to open-mindedness on any given topic. Um, and so this student is somewhere on that journey, as are all students. So if we begin to recognize them as, as being in a place on a journey, then you ask, what's the next step? And how do we get them to that next step? And what does that next step look like, as opposed to you know this formidable final goal of complete enlightenment and open-mindedness, which I don't think any of us has reached anyway. Uh, I also have found it useful to think about students, especially in the context of multicultural education, uh, as, as being multifaceted, right? So you have students who are intellectually high functioning. They know their stuff, they can quote things, they are very good on tests, they write beautifully. But their interpersonal skills are pretty darn lousy. Right? Uh, they, they can't interact with people who have different opinions in the class. Maybe. Right? Or, or you might have students who feel very strongly about issues and are very gumbo about environmental justice or this, that, and the other. Uh, but have trouble in other ways, uh, getting their head around the intellectual side of it, completely understanding some of the text, and so on and so forth. So understanding students in these different dimensions has, has become helpful to me because then you don't just pigeonhole a student. And then you also begin to recognize that each brings some strengths into the classroom. So how do you use that as a catalyst uh, for some kind of teaching? You also begin to recognize that the students are human beings, right? They have social lives. Uh, they have they, they have a social emotional side to them. Uh, and frequently, we think of students solely in terms of that intellectual potential, where we're dealing with them with their brains, not with their hearts, not with their spine, not with their courage, right? So there are lots of these things that go into making a student that I uh, found has been useful for me as a teacher. Uh, to work in these uh, somewhat difficult uh, situations as they might arise. Uh, I also think as a teacher, it's very important for us to look at power dynamics. Uh, there is power in the classroom. And frequently, the traditional power dynamic is the student, the teacher is right, and the student better just follow along. Right? Uh, it doesn't always make for a good outcome, especially if you have a difficult situation in the classroom. Um, and so I, I try to, to work as far as possible to think about this not as my classroom, but our classroom, right? So that gets now me to my second topic uh, in this conversation, which is what do we do on day one? I think setting the tone on day one of a class is absolutely vitally important. And I know for most of us, 
it is that time where we go through the syllabus and tell them what the absence policy is and whether they can hand things late and how to find whatever link on Canvas and uh, you know this, that, and the other. Um, I, I try to, while, while those things also need to happen and students tend to be obsessive about those, I try to set those nuts and bolts uh, aside or make them relatively less important and, and highlight what we are going to be doing as a community in this class. What is the climate of this class going to be such that it will be conducive to learning? Uh, and, and try to, to place emphasis on that. So one of my, so, so my more favorite things as an educator, and this may or may not work in all contexts, uh, is, is I, I walk in and I say, because I'm teaching future teachers especially, I want to reclaim education as spaces of joy. Learning has to be joyful. We are going to have to have some fun here. We're going to have to learn how to enjoy this experience, right? And you have to exude that on day one and, and help students to recognize, yes, you will be learning. Yes, it will be tedious. Yes, there will be work. But yes, we're going to get something out of this, right? Now, it's particularly easy for me as a teacher of future teachers also to make that a moral obligation. Because if you're not having fun learning, how are you going to instill that same fun in your future students, right? Uh, but it's also a way of getting students on board and, and, and beginning to think about what, what turns them on. I also tell them a catalyst in learning, especially in our class, is diversity. Diverse opinions make us better thinkers. We have to deal with these different ideas. So different opinions would be an important catalyst for learning. We say that right out front, right? Uh, now, I also controversially some say, not all of those are equal in my head, but certainly all of those perspectives need to be discussed. You know, and so people go, hey, what do you mean? Everything should be equal. No, I'm sorry. White supremacy is not the same as pluralism. I'm sorry, right? So there are some things given our field that, that they're all are not equal, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a place for that discussion in the class. Uh, we talked a little bit about respect before. So part of this whole dialogue and, and, and the presence of diversity comes with respect. We talk about what that respect means and what it doesn't mean. So respect is not the PC uh, idea that we don't uh, contradict somebody in class. No, we do challenge, Do we do ask. But how do you do that in a way that is, as we understand it, respectful? And so the social construction of respect in our class has to be addressed. Uh, I also make a difference between dialogue, debate, uh, spe specifically dialogue and debate. Debate is uh, Debate is when we we are trying to persuade people of a different of a particular position, right? And the idea is to convince someone to get your facts and so on and so forth. Dialogue, on the other hand highlights listening. And so it's very important for us to understand both of those. Both of those strategies will, will come into play at some point in the class. Uh, I think in many senses, I, I, want us, I want to almost end my comments by really reflecting or have us reflect collectively on what our roles are as educators at this level. Up to now, we've sort of talked about, you know, we're in multicultural education, we're in science education, we're in wherever it is that we are. But we're in Florida Atlantic University, charged with helping students acquire an education, which makes them an educated citizen. They go out of here as FAU alum. What does that mean for us? Because I think there is something more to education than merely transmitting knowledge of engineering, knowledge of mathematics, knowledge of science, knowledge of history, all of which are vitally important. But there is also that piece of citizenship, responsibility, leadership, which you may or may not get in a particular course, which now students' following plans don't allow for. Right? So we have to think about how do we, all of us, 
own the responsibility of shaping what might be a future governor, what might be a future president, what might be a future leader in charge of either supporting or dismantling the EPA. These are all real questions for us as we contemplate our roles within a democratic society. Um, and so in, in some senses, I, I'd like us to talk both about the nitty gritty of what we do in classes to facilitate uh, conducive learning environments, but also to talk about a much broader role. And, and in my view, a sacred role for our obligations <coughs> in a democratic society. I think educators play a vital role here, no matter what we teach. And uh, since this is coming in as uh, under the auspices of Peace, Justice, and Human Rights Initiative, I think it's pertinent for us to think of ourselves in advancing those causes as well. I'm just going to stop there, and let's open up the dialogue. we become uh, very mindful that in the classroom we're really teaching the whole student, not just the student who's in the classroom, but that student who's outside the classroom. And I think as the panelists talk about, we're one of the agents of socialization, but there's many agents, and some of these agents uh, we oftentimes have to confront sometimes uh, in, in terms of uh, their ideologies in the classroom. Um, one conclusion I draw from all three presentations is that quality teaching is difficult. It, it's uh, you know being a good teacher in the classroom, uh, no matter what subject matter, no matter what uh, class you're teaching, this takes effort, this takes determination, this takes desire. Um, and I think that um, you know this sort of form will recognizes that you can aspire to great teaching, but that it's a, it takes time um, to actually uh, to be able to perfect those skills. So what I'd like to do is um, again open up uh, questions. Um, I'll ask Lenny to go ahead and demute uh, for our colleagues who are joining us remotely. And for uh, David Christie, uh, Bertrida, and with uh, Ethan, if any of you have questions, I'd like to give you uh, kind of first cracks that you've uh, taken time to join us remotely um, and uh, open up the floor from, uh, for any questions. For us. So yeah, if, just to make sure, um, I appreciate everyone uh, following uh, kind of the directions to, to mute because again, it, it facilitates for our recording of this. We actually recorded the session, we'll post it on our YouTube channel. Uh, but uh, you can go ahead and unmute at this point in time just so that you'll be able to use your, uh, your microphone to ask any question. Uh, but it looks like you can also send it by chat if, for whatever reason if mm -hmm. you don't even have a microphone. It looks like we have a question from Christy. So Christy's question, what would you say to parents or community people who are resistant to teaching these topics? Okay, we've had a lot, number of different topics that we've covered. My first crack at this is we get this uh, question asked a lot within our own classes. Uh, and especially as I talk to uh, students who are going to be future teachers, I say, what? how would you have responded if you had been a teacher in the 1950s and you were told there are parents in the community who are against you teaching in an integrated school? We do not want you to have you know, students of a different race uh, with, with our kids in the same classroom and so on and so forth. Um, and, and oftentimes that puts things in perspective. Um, and so to parents, if this is knowledge that's floating out there, we need to equip your students to handle this knowledge. Uh, that's what I would say to parents, including knowledge that they will not get from within this house. It's important for them to know the world in which they're going to be living in, and hopefully if they're going to be leaders, the world that they will have to govern. So knowing as much about society in all of its aspects is vitally important for your students' success if they ever hope to have leadership aspirations. That's one way to look at it. 
Uh, it is challenging. And um, one of the ways that, um, through case studies again, to help students preserve as teachers, um, talk to parents and bring them in and as they're advocating for their children, there, there are ways the, the dialogue has to include the families um, and making that a safe environment for families um, and not rushing to judgment if families can't physically come, you know, and writing them off as not being interested in their kids, but being willing to engage in dialogue with the families, the parents, on what you're teaching as well and what your goals are. Um, sometimes uh, parents' resistance is because they just don't understand what it is exactly you're teaching and they're getting uh, little pieces of it and they're not really comfortable with it. So giving full disclosure um, is usually a, a good technique and this is something that we, uh, we practice through case studies with, um, with the, the students. Yeah. I would just add um, from a from a perspective of uh, the standards. If you start within the standards, either the national science standards, the national social studies standards, if you use the state standards, that's kind of like your trunk of support. And if parents have issues with something that you're teaching from the standards, you should just say, talk to the principal, talk to the standards writer. That's not me. As soon as you leave the standards and start going out on your own into topics you feel passionate about, it's the tree analogy, right? You're on that limb. And the further that is from the standards, the further out on the limb you're going, you need to be able to justify your own personal decisions for what you're teaching then. So I always say start with the standards. And if you're teaching something that's in the standards, you don't need to justify it to parents. You don't need to justify that to community members. If they have issues with it, they need to take that up with the standard. Lots of really smart people write those standards. It takes them years. They argue about it constantly. So that's a good place to start. So we have a question from Rachida that I'll turn it over to our audience here. Um, how, do you, um, how do you respond when a student feels threatened by the diversity of positive perspectives on an issue, the cognitive dissonance that we've been talking about? Is the question how do you respond to students who are exhibiting cognitive dissonance? What exactly they, they feel threatened by the discussion mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. There, you know, there's a lot of ways to set the stage, uh, and she passed on day one, but um, allowing the diverse viewpoint to, to be there with, with rules, you know, that uh, they have to be, um, you know, uh, expressing themselves in a, in a in a way that articulates what their resistance is and to be aware of what their resistance uh, is itself. Um, and sometimes it's, it's just acknowledging you know, they have a different viewpoint. You say, yes, I understand that's this, and here's another way to look at it. Here's a third way to look at it. So you, you, um, you, you try to avoid getting into a shouting match or you know, enforcing um, but giving them time to process the information because they may be processing it and just not articulating it. And then following up to find out where they are at a later date on that topic, on that issue. I think part of what, what we encounter as, as instructors is a generation of students who've been brought up to realize or think that there's only one right answer. So now suddenly there are five possibilities uh, becomes a, a, a problem in and of itself. But if, you, if you've structured your lessons such that you've said diversity is important and you're constantly looking at the extremes as, versus, as well as everything in between on any given topic, you always know that there is a range of opinion that's going to, to come up. So that becomes the norm. So you slowly sort of socialize the students into that. I think the bigger trouble for some of our students is they want to know what the right answer is so that C or D. And, and, and in that mentality also trips them up from an intellectual point of view as much as a cultural point of view. Yeah, I think for all of us, I think teaching the, to embrace ambiguity, uh, that sometimes there is no right answer, uh, or that right answers are situational. Um, is very, very challenging for students to understand uh, because, again, they feel also that this is testable material, so what is the answer uh, ultimately? So 
Um, let me go ahead and uh, now turn uh, the, uh, the questions over to the floor. And I think Lois, I think you had a question. Well, I want to go back to, um, I forget your name. Brian. Brian. Uh, talking about standards. Mm -hmm. I think that works. Mm -hmm. but, um, okay. Okay. <laughs> now the other group. Right. All right. So, uh, Brian talked about standards and referring back to standards, but in higher education, we're not dealing with standards. Uh, we have to. We are the uh, a community of standards. So, and we do have parents who uh, are disturbed by what. Uh, their children are learning in uh, in our classrooms, and they often say, "I want them to learn facts. I don't care about opinion." Uh, and uh, your job is not to, to encourage opinions, but to tell them the facts that are going to get them a job. So, um, in that in that instance, it strikes me that. Um, we have to look at the, the situation of ourselves as instructors. Are we authoritarian or are we authoritative? And if we're authoritarian, then yes, we're right and they are wrong and that's the end of the story. But if we're authoritative, we're people who possess more knowledge maybe than our students uh, and they can, maybe can trust that we are prepared to teach them. But we are in a conversation with our students, whether I'm teaching uh, the history of the French Revolution or uh, uh, the uh, Hellenistic period. There are facts, there are interpretations. I had one student one time ask me uh, about uh, Alexander the Great. And uh, in the textbook it said, Alexander the Great uh, had uh, married a Bactrian princess. Alexander the Great had a male companion. And the student raises his hand and he says, so are you telling me Alexander the Great was homosexual? How can you be teaching that in this, uh, in, in, a, in a college setting? And I'm thinking to myself, oh boy. And this was a Southern Baptist school. I said, well, let's talk about the norms of the time. What were the norms of those times? What are the norms of your times? Uh, and try to put the things in context like that, but you can't ignore it. You know, uh, there's, Yes, there's some rights and some wrongs, but uh, we don't have standards to fall back on. Uh, what we have to fall back on is trust in our, uh, our grasp of the knowledge and hopefully our trust in uh, developing a relationship of mutual uh, engagement with students. Uh, just to very quickly address that, we, we don't have standards in higher ed yet but uh, that's one of those things that may be lurking in our future whether we want them or not but my second my my second point to that would be that's when you need to um, very clearly look at what your learning goals are for the course those are the things that you need to justify well and if you find yourself in situations where you're getting into these issues and it's like wait this this isn't even part of why i'm teaching this course that's when you maybe have to say, okay, okay, we're going to back away from this, or maybe change your learning goals and say, you know what, this is really important, and it's really important that students learn to address this particular skill. And of course, our learning goals aren't always just content-based. Um, you know, and even even when we get into the job stuff, there's lots of employers who are like, yeah, they know this stuff, but they can't talk to each other, they can't interact with people, or whatever. So you, you get into those 21st century learning goals or whatever that are more socially you know, they, they focus more on kids socializing, communicating, critical thinking, all that kind of stuff. And so it's it's often a time, I would say, that yeah, if you're teaching in higher ed, you might not have direct standards to apply to, but you do have your course learning goals. And so reevaluate those and maybe strengthen them and it'll help you then to make those justifications when things get messy or even make changes. Like sometimes you are, you're kind of like, why am I doing this anymore? This is just too much trouble for the potential learning goal that I might be getting out of it. So it is a good time to reevaluate. And um, uh, there are external standards that we can also draw upon. The, uh, the values of the United States, uh, pluralism, freedom, justice, uh, these are standards. 
And, and when you're teaching social justice issues, those are the best standards to draw back on. I, I mentioned uh, religion and religious diversity. Uh, you have the First Amendment. You know, the, you know these are these are major standards that um, that inform our work. So. I think we have a question from the back. If you could just come up to the microphone, uh, just we need that for audio. First, let me say good morning and thank you for having this. Uh, so some of my things are comments more than questions. And even though there are comment, there's a, a question somewhere in there that's kind of disparate. I can't find it. Um, so I'm faculty in the College of Medicine. And one of the things that I teach is within our cultural competency thread. So this is things like LGBT health and social determinants of healthcare. And um, a few of you touched on changing the way you teach things. So I taught this social determinants lecture for the first time last semester. It was actually spring semester, and it was lively. <laughs> um, and even though everything that I was presenting was hedged in research, it was, like you said, it was not accepted because I'm fighting against the machine, basically. Um, so what I did was I showed a documentary. We are broken up into, the students are broken up into PBL groups. And so I had each one watch a documentary on a certain section that talked about basically, if you don't have a higher education, if you don't have a certain income level, you're going to die earlier than other people that do. It's basic just, right? But because it didn't come from my voice, and it came from a video from people who were respected, it was, the dynamic was completely different. So I do appreciate what many of you said about changing the way you frame the topic, because I, I found value in that. But I want to talk more from a process perspective. Part of the issues that I personally see is we are, obviously we're sitting here and people are chiming in because we're interested in diverse perspectives. But if we are not training all faculty, if this is not mandatory, and I know that M word is a bad word, then we're not meeting the need of the people that actually need it. So that's part of my process, my, um, something I see that is a shortcoming. And in the College of Medicine, we can make nothing mandatory. So I don't know what it's like in the broader university. So you've just thrown us a curveball. Because you're saying on the one hand, we have to make this mandatory, but you're also saying the places that it's needed, you really can't make anything mandatory. Um, I know. So how do we make this exciting enough that people see us having way too much fun and want to start joining us. Or maybe it's that high, high leadership mandated, and because it's coming from top down, maybe that's the way to do it. I'm not sure. That's, so that's something that I'm putting out to the panel. Um, the second thing is space in the curriculum for diverse topics. So I mentioned that one of the things that I do is LGBT health, and we currently have 10 hours, and to get anything more than that is begging, borrowing, stealing, and cutting off somebody's arm, basically. So how can we do that? And in the College of Medicine, that's a different issue, I think, than in the larger university. But I think that that is a problem all the way around. So how can we address that? Um, and then part of, part of this is just a statement. If we're going to be aware of diversity and what we're teaching in the classroom, I personally would like to see that come from top down. Um, I think it was spring of last semester, or it was late fall of last semester, there were white supremacist flyers found on this campus. And there was no acknowledgement by higher leadership about that. And there were some found in our buildings, and nothing was said. So if we're going to talk about diversity and inclusion, I think it also needs to be echoed all the way around. Now, if something was said and I didn't see it, let me put that as my caveat. But from what I saw, that nothing came out. And I know that that is not the feeling of our higher leadership or of anyone in the classrooms. Um, but sometimes the perception can be there if nothing is seen. And so I want to draw our attention to that as well. Let me, uh, I think uh, David had a quick question. Let me just get to one of the online questions very quickly and I'll send the floor back over. So, so David asks, what can be done to encourage support for the exploration of controversial topics from faculty in other courses, departments, heads, et cetera, so that my students hear from multiple sources that these skills and competencies 
or valuable to them, and it really echoes it echoes exactly the the sort of uh, comments that you were making about you know valuing quality teaching, valuing diversity has to come from leadership, um, and uh, so I think David also has kind of the same sort of question: of how do we encourage uh, an expression of the uh, importance of diversity? I think this is, I mean, I, I didn't start it after the presentation with an elephant in the room. There are several elephants, I think, on this one here, because, uh, I mean, I've been involved with diversity forums in this university on and off for quite a long time. And the general situation in this is that they are largely attended by people who, who are like-minded. Uh, and the, the administration is absent, right? So how do we begin to to get the message out about this uh, is is a dilemma that and a struggle that we've been have we we've is been has been ongoing i i don't know what we could do about it except for strengthening our own forces and if more of us keep doing this uh maybe students will see the need maybe that's the way to 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 get by or maybe peace justice and human rights can do something about it i'm not sure so um, let me just say that i think that um, for me at least um, having come from other universities I'm, I'm been surprised that there's not more emphasis on faculty development um, for uh, for a young i can remember being a young faculty member and you know having to confront some of these issues for the first time um, and uh, informally talking to colleagues is certainly beneficial, but I think to have uh, a structure of organization where you have a place to go to, where the resources that are being presented by our colleagues today, for instance, kind of a repository of you know, different types of techniques. Um, and again, uh, we're talking about faculty members. I think it's, a, personally, I think it's even more critical for teaching assistants because they're teaching usually uh, students that are their same age cohort. Um, and again, we talked about the power of disparity um, in there. That's where the power disparity uh, really gets challenged those for teaching assistants because they're not seen as authoritative. Uh, they're not seen as, as being powerful. So I think that um, what we had talked about is I do hope that this is a, a salvo that there needs to be robust faculty development uh, that occurs at the university for, for all faculty, no matter whether you're a first year uh, faculty member or a uh, have had a long-standing uh, experience in the classroom. We all benefit, I think. I, I've learned a lot just hearing, you know, the, the comments from my colleagues today. Let me go ahead and turn it It's actually addressed to this question. That's all right. Go ahead. Just to weigh in quickly, and not to sound like a broken record, but maybe this comes from an education perspective as well. If we want more time for these things, if we want more buy-in across the university and with other, because you know, being undercut when they go to the next class is obviously not good when we're dealing with this stuff. So if we want more buy-in, we want more time, we need clear goals that are educational in our syllabi, and we need those goals to be well justified with benefits for the students, and then we need evidence that these benefits are actually accruing to the students. So we need to, and you can show all those things, you can show, here's what I'm doing, here's why I'm doing it, here's why it's good for students, and here's evidence to show that it's benefiting them, then it's much easier to make a case for, and the rest of you should be doing this as well. So I would come at it from, that's kind of a sciencey perspective, I suppose, but when you come at it from that sort of evidence, educational, and we don't all do education research, but you can make a pretty good argument that this is a good, a good way for education research to support what we're trying to do. I always describe the resistance as feeling like a salmon swimming against the current. And the outcome is um, not always what you would expect or want. But the challenges are both micro and macro at the, at the macro level. Um, I think that we're, we're functioning in a climate that is resisting um, what we're talking about. And, um, and, and it would be really good to have um, high-powered advocates um, to maybe even put pressure on university leadership on um, why this is important. You know, it is, diversity is a pillar of the institution, 
Um, but but it's on, but it's a it's a paper. <laughs> it's on paper. What does that mean? And uh, and unfortunately, I think you know the profit motive and, and work and all that uh, has always uh, overshadowed uh, the social justice aspect of what we do. And um, it, it's exhausting work, but I think forums like this are really important and continued uh, to build a cadre of people um, who come from different perspectives but have but shared goals um, to, to do this, to put, you know, put it out in the public sphere. Um, when letters, uh, white supremacy pamphlets show up, uh, the media should be contacted about that. The university will listen if it's reported in the news. So giving those kinds of um, strength to, to what we're doing to support our mission, uh, sometimes we have to be a little bit more political. Hi, uh, my name is Lewis Merlin. I'm a faculty in the uh, School of Urban and Regional Planning. I wanted to comment on two things. One is the question of, of standards and, and being uh, faculty uh, in the university. Uh, I don't know if this is applicable to other uh, fields, but my field, we our, our department is accredited by the Planning Accreditation Board, and they have standards that pertain to all of the issues we're talking about. They have they require you to address equity uh, in the in the urban planning curriculum. They require you to address sustainability in the urban planning curriculum. So you know, it seems to me and, and it, that that we don't need to just we can appeal to the uh, Authorities at the university, but also within our specialization, within our uh, 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 fields, there can be standards uh, of what is expected to be covered, and they can cover issues of equity and diversity. The second point I wanted to highlight is I think Christy Padron's question, which she, she used a, a particular phrase there, which is uh, parents uh, say that you know I have a right uh, to my opinion, and I think this this is a real um, Seismic cultural shift, where basically there's this, there's this, there's I think a relatively new belief in, in the incomplete equivalence of all opinions. Um, there's actually an article in the Atlantic Monthly about this, about how uh, some avant-garde uh, left thinkers have kind of led the way to this equivalence of all opinions. And I think what we have to do in response is point out that. Um, all opinions actually are not equivalent, and that there's matter that there's that, that what we do in the universities we appeal to evidence, uh, and, and and so it's not that we have to we have to counter argue that this this very widespread belief now that, that all opinions are, are equivalent, and point out that there's a system a systematic method for inquiry uh, critically into the value the, the merit of different opinions and perspectives that, that the the, ab, the absolute right to your opinion. You, have an, you do have an absolute kind of uh, right to your opinion in terms of your autonomy, your, your intellectual autonomy, but that doesn't make all opinions equivalent or equivalent to valid. And I think that's that's what we're fighting against. Um, I'm mindful of the time. It's uh, it's 11:30. Um, we we have one, one more question. I waited till the end because I'm from engineering and we don't have these social problems. Thanks, <laughs> God. But we have a different problem that I would like you to think and maybe don't have an answer today, maybe for next time when we have a gathering like this. The problem we have in engineering is that many students want to be engineers, but they don't have the engineering mind. How do we tell them to get out of the college? Thank you. <laughs> I give you an example. Some people like to do engineering because they think they make money, because they become inventors in the future, but they do not have enough mathematics. We are wired differently. Just like I cannot be a social worker, some people cannot be an engineer. End of the story. So how do we do this? How do we help? Especially when I'm teaching classes like 2,000 levels, 3,000 levels, I can tell they cannot be engineers. They struggle, 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 because some of them, I see them when they come to the bad graduation, 4,000 different classes. How much engineering background they have? Zero. And they're about to graduate, and they're going to end up having engineering jobs, and guess what? Their buildings will collapse, their cars will crash, their electronic <laughs> How do we, we have, this is an issue. Yeah. You know,
want to think about it the next time? <laughs> So, um, again, I, I, I'm sure our panelists will be happy to stay around to have discussions with anyone from the audience. Um, and uh, again, we all hope that this is the beginning of a conversation, not, not the end of a conversation. And I certainly will be taking back uh, any feedback or comments that you have uh, back to the provost office um, and to you know, talk about the importance that a faculty members see in being able to share issues of pedagogy um, and the diverse views of, and social justice issues that are involved. So please uh, join me in thanking our panelists today. <laughs> and again, we'll, uh, we've got some handouts for everyone. Um, we'll be posting this on YouTube, so feel free to share it with your colleagues. We'll also try to create a web page with any sort of electronic links that any uh, faculty members will have. And certainly if there's any information any of you um, as uh, participants in this, because you're colleagues, um, if you've got information that you would like to share that we want to post on our web page, feel free to do so because, you know, information is power. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.